Hey, this is Justin from BreakingTheCRE.com, and in today's video, we're gonna break down what a good IRR actually looks like for a commercial real estate deal. So if you're analyzing a new potential commercial real estate acquisition and wanna make sure you have your numbers right, but you're also looking at the right metrics, make sure to stick around for this video. Now, if you're new here on this channel, we talk about real estate investing careers and real estate finance and financial modeling. So if you're looking to break into the business or advance your current real estate investing career, make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell. So if you're analyzing a new commercial real estate acquisition or development opportunity, one of the most important return metrics that you're going to use for that acquisition or development is going to be your internal rate of return or IRR. Now, when it comes down to it, the IRR on your deal is going to tell you an annualized rate of return taking the time value of money into play and also taking into account all of the different cash flows in your deal, including your net operating income, your capitalized expenses, and your loan metrics on the deal, like your loan proceeds, your loan payoff, and the loan payments that you have every month. But when you take all of those cash flows and calculate that internal rate of return, what is the IRR that you should be looking for? What is a good IRR for your specific deal? That's what we're gonna talk about in this video. Now in real estate, the first thing to mention is that usually there's going to be a range of internal rate of return values that are going to vary based on whether you're analyzing the deal on a levered basis or with debt or an unlevered basis without debt. Now generally what you'll see as far as a range is concerned is somewhere between 6% and 11% on an annualized basis for somewhere between a five and 10 year hold period. Now for a leverage basis, since most investors will assume that debt will help their returns, those numbers jump to anywhere from about 7% up to around 20% for that internal rate of return range in those initial underwriting phases. Now to determine where that acquisition or development project is going to fit within those ranges, there are really going to be two main factors that are going to affect this. The first is going to be the risk profile of the deal that you're analyzing. So for the highest risk deals, you're going to be closer to that 20% end of the spectrum. And for the lowest risk deals, you're going to be closer to that 7% end of the spectrum. Now the rationale behind this is that investors are going to price risk in the market based on what they believe the risk is for each deal. So in order to take on significant risk, like a major renovation project or a ground up development project, most investors are going to need to be compensated to take that risk with a higher internal rate of return closer to the 20% end of the spectrum. And for the lower end of the spectrum, the reverse is true. So if investors are being offered a deal in a core market with very low risk, they're going to accept a lower annualized rate of return because they're not taking on the kind of risk that they would with a ground up development deal or a major rehab project. Now, the second big factor in this is going to be timing. So the internal rate of return calculation takes into account that time value of money, meaning that the cash flows that you receive earlier on after that initial equity investment are going to be much more valuable and impactful to that internal rate of return than those cash flows that you receive later on in that hold period. So for projects that are going to be sold or recapitalized within two, three, four, or five years, most investors are going to require a higher internal rate of return just because inherently receiving that capital back, whether it's from sale proceeds or refinance proceeds, is going to produce a much higher IRR than if you sell the property eight, nine, or 10 years after that initial equity investment. Additionally, investors will place value on having their capital out in the market for a longer period of time because they don't have to worry about quickly going through the process of redeploying capital after a sale of the property, and they don't have to deal with the headaches and the costs of doing a transaction every 24 to 36 months. So at the end of the day, when you're doing your analysis and trying to figure out what that IRR target should be, the two most important things to think about are going to be the risk profile of the deal and how long you plan to hold the property for. So the riskier that deal is and the shorter your hold period, the higher that return expectation should be. And the less risky the deal is and the longer you hold the property, the lower that return expectation should be. So I hope that was helpful as you head into your first or next commercial real estate investment analysis. If you wanna learn more about commercial real estate investment analysis and how all of this actually fits into commercial real estate acquisition and development models, make sure to check out my free real estate financial modeling crash course and I'll link that in the description below. And that's gonna walk you step-by-step step through how a real estate financial model comes together and the different inputs and drivers that are going to drive 
your real estate investment returns, including that IRR. So if you like this video and want to see more content like this, let me know by hitting the like button, subscribe to the channel, and share this with anyone else who might find this helpful. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.